Hello. My name is Pykiss Chris. And I'm Bastard Swordsman. And welcome to another exciting episode of Scenes from a Podcast. Another film podcast because YouTube doesn't have enough of those already. And it's also the first of the year we're recording this on, actually, yeah, January 1st, 2023, because we took a break during the holiday season since we were both preoccupied with Christmas and, you know, New Year's Eve, I suppose, so, yeah. yeah. Fun times, fun times. I actually just I didn't uploaded get... the, the newest episode today, so. Yeah. Yeah, very, very busy, very busy. Lots of presents and money and all that. That's nice. Yeah. Uh, I got to hung, uh, hang out with a few friends and got a good amount of money. I drank a lot on Christmas, but... I didn't drink it all on New Year's Eve, but I am a very sick boy today. I've, I've been curled up in bed. Oh, yeah. Well, I hope you get better. Thank you, me too. Yes. It doesn't seem to be um, a deadly common cold or anything. Well, I mean, it's probably a common cold, but it's not deadly. It's only deadly if your mom's an anti-vaxxer. That's true. Um, so, uh, Chris, have you uh, seen anything interesting lately or played anything interesting? Any cool games? I've been meaning to, to watch the, the new Pinocchio film made by Guillermo del Toro. Guillermo del Toro. Mm. I know. I know I mispronounce his, his name despite the fact that I'm a fucking fanboy but i i haven't been able to get around to it just because like just like every time i get home from work the first thing i want to do is like fucking plop into my bed and die that's yeah that's capitalism they're trying to sap your energy with these banal stressful fatiguing jobs which also pay like crap, and then you're so fatigued after you get home, you don't feel like accomplishing anything, so you stay in your low social class and basically stuck there working for that crappy job, and, you know, what's a man do in today's messed up America? Thanks a lot, Obama. He's still the president, right? I haven't um, been paying attention the last few years. Uh, I think there were a couple other guys. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. They, they didn't, I wasn't really too interested in either of them. They seem kind of boring. Seem kind of politics. Kind of lame. Seem kind of cringe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, every politician is. Uh, um, I'm pretty sure. Um. Both were friends with Jeffrey Epstein, though. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, I just assume everyone in the in the capital is friends with Epstein. Every politician and every star in Hollywood. Yeah. Did you hear that? Like, apparently, Elon Musk <laughs> got caught with like his personal plane going to like going to Epstein Island recently. I'm not sure if that's like a like a myth or if that's something that like actually happened, but. Well, how recently? Because, like, Ep Epstein Island is, like, a publicly known location now, so... I think it was like, at least, like, in the last few weeks. Like, so... I mean, it wouldn't surprise me, like, but... I don't know, I don't... I, I don't think people are still going to Epstein Island. I could just be out of the loop since, you know, I, it's not really my crowd, but... Uh, <laughs> Well, I mean... Did you know that Epstein apparently had an egg-shaped penis? I... I... I didn't know that. Where, where did the, Where did you get this information? Um... I think it was in a court proceeding or something, where someone said he, like... He had an egg-shaped penis, like, um... <laughs> 
And he actually got really pissed off when people mentioned that. Apparently, he doesn't like people making fun of his egg-shaped penis. Or didn't, because he's obviously dead. I'm trying to picture what that would even look like. Like, how would... How do you how do you even maneuver that? Oh, I mean, I did see an erotic movie where uh, this girl did shove an egg up her vagina. So it was from the seventies, of course. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, they didn't have they didn't have dildos back in the seventies, so you got to make do. Anyways, um, what have you been up to, uh, bastard swordsman? Uh, not much, really. Just been working, uh, doing a bit of reading. I've been reading, um, A Certain Magical Index, a series of light novels. I took a break from it, but I'm about halfway through New Testament, which is, like, the second sort of series, and there are three series out right now. There's Old Testament, which is the first, like, 22 books, then New Testament is the next 23 books, and then there's Genesis Testament, which I think there are, like, eight books out so far, and it's still ongoing. But yeah, it's a really, really long series, and I believe... The whole series combined is at least four times the length of the Bible, maybe five times the length, I'm not sure. The irony being that it's broken up into an Old and a New Testament. Yeah, but, yeah, there are a lot of goofy characters, and there's a lot of cool action scenes, and there's some even... There are even some really emotionally resonant moments, um... Like, there was this one volume in New Testament that really got to me um, emotionally and honestly, like, sort of philosophically, and it was really existential, and it reflected on, you know, the purpose of, you know, existence, the fact that maybe you don't really have any meaning and that, like, really just as a single person maybe you're not so important in the world of course um you know it these these books tend to have like happy endings to the arcs but it, you know it was just really emotional though i don't know if i'm like selling this very well but you know. i mean i'm i'm assuming you're talking about like about proper Nietzschean nihilism where it's like you find your own meaning rather than like you just give up and don't do anything because you're yeah, lazy. That's, that's what it ended up being uh, in the arc, but yeah. Uh, yeah there are three main characters. Uh, Kami Jo Toma, who's like the main main character, and he's like the, you know, shonen protagonist you know he protects he fights to protect his friends and he uh <laughs> has these super virtuous motives and when he sees someone in trouble he he just always will want to help out it's just his nature although a uh, new testament sort of like dissects that and um shows that like due to his like very sort of selfish nature he has like made things a lot more difficult and caused a lot of de uh, destruction inadvertently even if he didn't mean to and so yeah he um it sort of dissects the morality of the you know goody two-shoes shonen protagonist and he sort of you know ends up being well, he's still a good guy, but, like, a bit more morally gray than, I don't know, someone like Naruto or Ichigo from Bleach or, or Luffy from One Piece. And then there's uh, Accelerator, who's basically Shadow the Hedgehog. He's actually really cool, though. Um, and then there's Hamazura, which who's kind of, like, the underdog. And they're very good characters, and there are a lot of good side characters. But, yeah, cool series. Uh, it's definitely a huge time commitment, but... Yeah. 
I would recommend if you just have a lot of free time and want to read some crazy anime books. Maybe I, I, I will. You know, I've been going to Bar Barnes and Nobles a lot recently uh, just to see what they've got there. Uh, a lot of a lot of nothing, mostly, you know, outside of a few like. Like a few things. I mean, but... they, they did have that SCP light novel that really caught your attention before. Uh, OK, OK, let me I here's the thing. OK. I I used to I used to write uh big old air quotes for that fucking website and then I left because uh none of my works were good and uh I also just didn't like the community it was very toxic or whatever but like fucking years later I see this I'm like oh this is nice I'll give it a look I didn't know it was a fucking light novel at the time and and like I I couldn't get past, like, the first page. Literally the first page I put it down, so. <laughs> uh, yeah, I like some light novels. There's definitely a lot of uh, trash and a lot of derivative crap. A lot of it's very tropey. And sometimes just the writing, like, the prose is simply not good. Um, which, part of it is definitely just because the writer isn't very talented, but also, um, light novels are published pretty quickly, so, like, basically a volume in a series will come out every few months, so, like, the translators, like, the big ones, anyway, kind of value, uh, value efficiency and, like, quick translations over good ones, although... Uh, there's one series I really like called ReZero, where there tend to be a few fuck-ups in essentially every volume, but, you know, I'm using um, a sort of guide to tell me what it's supposed to say, or what the actual original intent was supposed to be, which is kind of an awkward way of reading it, but I like the story, and, you know, but yeah, uh... A lot of light novels are just kind of trash, and I wouldn't accept, um, expect anything good from an SCP light novel, personally. Well, well, I mean, I wasn't expecting much, but I certainly wasn't expecting what I got, so. You should make, like, a review on it. Oh, God, that would, that would require me to actually read the rest of the book. Jesus. Oh, my God. Yeah, um... I haven't reviewed something in a really long time on my channel. It's been almost a year, but... I... Yeah. What did you say? You yeah, were gonna... uh, definitely one of my resolutions for this year was... Yeah, I think you cut out there for a minute. What? I, th I, think, I think you cut out there for a second. Oh, I wasn't saying anything. I just couldn't hear you for a second. Oh, okay, man. But yeah. So one of your resolutions is to, like, start writing something? Not start, but actually put out, like, Content. a good amount of videos, like, several this year. And I'd like to improve as I go along. But, yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, it's not a great start to my year if I'm, like, sick and I don't feel like, you know, working out or anything but yeah well i mean i'm sorry to hear that bro um i'm gonna i'm gonna pray for you or whatever so but uh thank you yeah no i'll i'll power through yeah so you have to be confident anyway yeah um yeah i can tell we're kind of going on for uh, a bit too long so if you don't mind, should I introduce the film today? Yes, go ahead. Ed. So in today's scene in the podcast, <laughs> well, even though movies are a lot of scenes, but, you know, I'm, I'm trying to make a motif here. Um, I recommended a film from 1996. It's directed by Olivier Assayas. It's called Irma Vep. 
It's a sort of drama comedy about an actress from Hong Kong who comes over to France and basically she's on a film set and they're directing a remake to a very old French serial film called The Vampires from 1915. Um, And I actually saw The Vampires in full. It's like seven hours. It's really crazy. It was originally released in ten separate parts, though, so it's a bit less taxing to just go to the separate parts. But anyway, so, yeah, they're making the film, and there's a lot of drama. (laughs) There's a lot of drama on set, and toxicity, and people aren't getting along. The director's kind of not too into it, and... Yeah, that's basically the setup. Um, what did you think of Irma Vep? I thought that as far as like films about the process of making films go, it was a pretty good one. I mean, I haven't seen a lot of those sort of things, but... I mean, it's it's always interesting to to see sort of the medium of film, I guess, commentate on itself in a way, you know? Yeah. Uh, One thing I found interesting, this doesn't necessarily have to do with any of the themes or whatnot, is that the, the actor Maggie Chong, I think that's, that's her last name. Maggie was, Chong. It's pretty close. You were pretty close. I was, I was as close as I can get with my, with my whatever's in my brain. But uh she's she's actually like a like a real person and she's like playing a fictionalized version of herself in this movie. So I don't know, I just you don't see that a lot. Like uh I guess it adds like a, a sense of like realism or whatever. Like like obviously I don't think the the events of this film are about something that actually happened, but I think like that by having like a real person in the film as like a character, it's sort of like alluding to well, like well, it could have happened, or we're we're pretending it happened, you know, because we know at the end it's very ambiguous whether or not the the film itself actually got made or if they like gave up on it. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, um, Maggie Chung does basically play herself, and it's weird to say this, but she does a really good job at playing herself. Her performance is really naturalistic. She feels like a real person because she is one, and that's a sort of like weird acting to like play yourself, but she also is a good, um, She's basically, well, unless you're French yourself, the film is in French, but a lot of the dialogue is in English, and Maggie Chung can't speak French because she's not a dirty Francophile. Uh, she only speaks Cantonese and English because obviously uh, That's Hong the Kong. Was, Franca. Yeah, Hong Kong was still a British colony at this time. Uh, yeah, they'd only be relinquished back to China. One year after this film was made. Um, But yeah, uh, Maggie Chung's English is, you know, very easy to understand. She has a sort of British accent, but a lot of the French actors, even when they were speaking English, I still needed subtitles, honestly, because their accent is so thick. Yeah, that was... I, I honestly... Yeah, that is a problem I had with the film. I mean... I don't know what else to say about it, but like a a lot of the film is in subtitle because a lot of the time they're not speaking like English anyway, but like when they are speaking English, like Maggie's the only one who's like fluent enough in it to where she's like eligible to actual English speakers. Everyone else is sort of like 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, 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 you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, the guy who plays the director uh, is called Jean-Pierre Lowe, and he's actually a really big, famous actor in France. He's been in a lot of big films since he was basically a teenager, he started out as a child actor, um, and his big break uh, out role was in this film called The 400 Blows, which is a really famous, well-regarded film, and he was in a lot of big films from the 60s, and another film he was in is called Day for Night, which is from the early 70s, and this film reminded me of that film, Day for Night, because they're both about um people trying to make a movie and there's a lot of um you know drama and clashing egos and you know differing opinions of how the film should be made and uh day for um the director of this film uh olivier assayas did say that day for night was a really big um influence for this film but he considers that to be more the fan like a fantasized version of filmmaking whereas this he he wanted to make something that felt more like he wasn't like saying it in a negative way either he like obviously was a big positive influence but this is meant to be a more grounded version of making a film like yeah yeah it's yeah it is kind of funny because I feel like a lot of people, um, even if you haven't been on a movie set, you can sort of relate to the very aggressive atmosphere, like a lot of people talking shit about each other and, uh, you know, people who have a hard time working with others and certain people and, you know, it... Kind of reminds me of almost my work environment. Like, it's quite toxic. Yeah. I mean, one of my favorite parts of the film, spoilers, I guess, is is the part where it's like they, they finish the shoot for the day and they, and they all go back to this one person's place. I'm not sure whose house it is. I think it's the house of the costume designer's mother. But I could just be, like, remembering that wrong. But but it's basically them all like sitting down at dinner, and I don't think she was the father. She was just like a sort of friend. Yeah, yeah, I guess I don't know. She seemed older, so I guess I just made her the the mom in my yeah. mind. But they they're all basically like shit talking the director and 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 talking about like how they how they feel you know they're they don't feel like their work is being appreciated and they feel like they're the ones like holding it all together you know it it all feels like very real especially when it comes to like the co-director who's who's you know who's going along with it but yeah you can sort of like feel like the so the, like this is definitely you know a film. Oh, sorry. Yeah, he like he he said something about like working with this guy for years and and like he still feels like he's being treated like like a lesser rather than like an like an equal and it's like I I don't necessarily work in the the film industry but I work adjacent to it now sort of so it's like it's. It's definitely something that that sort of rings true to life. You know, you can feel the writers and whatnot were drawing on their own experiences when they were making this. Yeah, there's... Well, this is obviously a film about making movies, but also, of course, a film just about movies in general, their place in the cultural zeitgeist, how movies have changed like in france and also worldwide and you know tastes have changed and also tastes are dependent on culture uh i think yeah it was a good choice to pick uh the vampires as the film that they would be 
that the characters would be remaking because it is considered to be a huge milestone in just film in general, like narrative film. It has like a huge cast of characters. It's one of the big uh, first big crime dramas. Um, and it's just a very well-regarded film, especially in France. And the film touches on the role of a remake, like what's the point in remaking something? Um, and how much should we stick to the original when remaking that? Or, um, because like uh, Jean-Pierre Lode's character, the director, doesn't seem too enthusiastic about the idea of a remake, but he's also like following the original really closely. Like some shots are like or some scenes that they film are just shot for shot, basically, and it's even silent. So he's basically just trying to make the same film again, but with a different cast. Um and yeah, like, um, the end of the film is kind of interesting because, um, I don't know, uh, how did you interpret the weird, like, editing changes that he made in post-production? I, I interpreted that as being, like, part of his breakdown, like, like he yeah. was like basically disowning the film and like saying this is garbage. I don't want this to see the light of day. Or you could also like and I and I recognize this goes with what you said, where it's like you were talking about it being like a shot for shot remake where it's like, it's like he's trying to like. Make it his own. Yeah, make it his own. And it's like it's it's not necessarily the different work of the camera or or what happens in the film, it's like what he adds in post-production that sort of differentiates it, which I add that thought, but I, but I also, I think that the former is more likely, so. Yeah, well, I feel like most people, if they saw that in theaters, they'd be like, what the hell is this garbage? But like, also this is like a, like a very pretentious, you know, French director with delusions of grandeur and a lot of the big um, iconic directors in France do have really weird out there experimental films. So I think it is maybe supposed to be a bit more of like a admirable thing within the context of the film that, oh, he did sort of make it his own, even if I would say it, it is definitely a jumbled mess and not exactly very watchable. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it, it's interesting also that, like, in the film, he hires an actress that's that's mostly known, at least I'm assuming from what, like, was shown of the films that she was in in the movie that they that he was, like, using as reference. That's mo mostly known for, like, action films, like, sort of kung fu style flicks. And he's putting her in this very slow paced, very ambiotic. I don't think I use that word right. Ambience driven sort of silent film. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. Well, Maggie Chung herself has been in like dramas, although I do find it interesting that the film that the director sees that makes him come to the conclusion, yes, I must have this actress in my film is a sort of kung fu action, like, fantastical action movie, which is completely different from your average French film. Yeah, it's like, it, it's like deciding you want Woody Harrelson in, like, your, in, like, your, your art film, but only after you saw Let There Be Carnage, so... I, I did see an art film with Woody Harrelson recently, and it was actually pretty good. But, yeah, it was called Triangle of Sadness. Triangle of Sadness. I think I heard of that. Yeah. But, um, yeah, okay. so, so I'm, I'm assuming, assuming 
would most definitely assume you haven't seen the original film that they're remaking in this film, The Vampires, but like, you know, I actually have seen it, and I mean, personally, like, I respect its place in the film canon, but I don't enjoy it. Uh, the camera is very static for a large majority of the film. The director sort of just, you know, points and shoots and that's it. And there are some nice, like, compositions and shots with a lot of actors that must have been difficult to coordinate, but it is a very uh, kind of boring film, in my opinion. Um, and I think, so that's I, guess kind of, I think that's kind of the point, though, is that it's, like, yeah. by our standards, it would be. Because film mm -hmm. has sort of evolved and moved on, and it's, like, it's not just a cultural thing. I think it's also, like, a, like a time thing. I think that honestly plays even more than culture into like how yeah. we perceive film. There is that scene where Maggie Chung is being um, interviewed by the one guy and he's like, you actually like this director's films? They're garbage. It's like very t typical, very derivative of the uh, like of french films it's just they're a dime a dozen here we see them all the time we want something different we want we want schwarzenegger and john claude van damme and it's kind of funny to see this like french guy talking about how he wants like the people of france are clamoring more for action blockbusters and then in a uh, the u.s today a lot of people are getting kind of uh, burned out on that kind of film and they want something different. Yeah. You but, see, like, I'm not sure if I'm like remembering the scene wrong. I, I got the sense that because I'd have to watch it again. Uh, when I saw it, I thought that like the, the guy interviewing her was like deriding the other films she was in and saying that like you know, this action schlock has no place in the in the world of cinema. You know, it, sh it should all be art films all the time. And I, and no. she and I, I think I am misremembering it, but. Yeah, the way I remember it, um, no, uh, he was more like we want action films and like he was shit talking the uh, director's film in his previous films and saying that people want something different. And like Maggie Chung was like, well, I kind of liked the director's films. Like, you know, even if, you know, you might see them as derivative and of other, like the mainstream French film, like this is sort of just, you know, another pretentious art film. But, you know, I enjoy it, and it has its place. I'm sure many other people enjoy this sort of thing, and I think this at least has a right to exist, basically, is what I think she was, yeah, what she was saying. Uh, I think sort of related to that is is also, like, the the dude who like comes in at the end to like take over from directing because because yeah. the uh, the other directors break down and i and i found it interesting because it's like up until now this is like the only time in the film it's actually brought up that 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 maggie isn't french and that really nobody else working on the film gives a shit about that but there's this this guy comes in and he and he's basically like taking advantage of the situation to say, well, because of the film's, you know, historical relevance to to French culture and whatnot, the 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 lead should be French too. Why is why is a Chinese woman, why is a a woman from Hong Kong, you know, why is she French the lead? cinema is going woke? Yeah, <laughs> French cinema is going woke. Yeah, that was. If this was made twenty years after, he probably would have had like some sort of anti SJW uh, YouTube channel or something. Yeah, that would. 
I, I really do like though that he's like a like an older gentleman, more so stuck in his ways rather than like a angry younger tryhard or whatever. You know, it it makes it feel like it's more his actual opinion, even if it's like a incredibly racist opinion. You know, it it makes him feel like it feels more like more timeless i guess the racism aspect of it than if it was like from the what we associate that with now i'm probably not making any sense whatsoever but no i get what you're sort of saying because yeah. <laughs> because even knives out the the last one we talked about even if it wasn't saying anything that we disagreed with or- it it was still sort of dated by like the the talk of SJWs and alt right trolls and whatnot. Oh yeah, like I saw that in theaters, and even I was like, eh, I'm not really a big fan of that lingo. It's not going to age very well. And even only like three years later, you know, it's still it's aged pretty bad already. Yeah. But um, yeah, um. So the the eponymous Irma Vep is definitely the most interesting or one of the most interesting aspects of the original film and also one of the most discussed. Um, and like she's seen as a huge, important, like early uh, female character in film. And uh, a lot of people have differing opinions on her role in the film, though. Some people say she's a feminist icon. Some people say that she's sort of just submissive because she is just the object of desire of a lot of dudes. And she does, like, have... Well, I mean, she's it's, it's from the 1910s, so you don't really see it. But she's going to be implied to have had sex with all those guys and... Some people even see that as different, like Jean-Pierre Lowe basically sees her as a slut and Maggie Chung thinks that, oh no, she's just a woman who, you know, she might have some morally questionable principles, but, or she might not have many principles, but, you know, she's forceful and, you know, she likes that. She's her own woman and she knows what she wants, basically. And I feel like that sort of reflects Maggie Chung, um... I've also seen people interpret Irma Vep, the character, like as a lesbian, because of course, even though there's not really much in the film to imply that, and that sort of also ties back into this film where there's the uh, other woman who has a crush on Maggie Chung, and she's like, hey, you think she likes girls? And like, um... She, she doesn't actually even, like, really say if she's into girls, like, she's, like, she hears that her co-worker has a crush on her, and she's like, oh, haha, really, that's, that's, wow, um, and, like, you know, but either way, she does, uh, reject the girl at the end, so, yeah, it's kind of interesting that they had that plot line in the film, like, around a real person, but, uh, like, yeah, I don't really know where to go with this, but... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's interesting that people can have a lot of interpretations of, like, the motives and morality of a character who's essentially just, like, a, a hypnotized slave. You know, it's like... Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I feel like it's pretty cut and dry, personally. You know, I haven't even seen the movie, but I've seen, like, the... It's like how much agency can a character have if like they're they're under a spell, you know? Well, to be fair, she is only hypnotized for like a couple of the uh like segments or episodes or whatever you want to call them. But yeah. I see. Well then. Mag uh Maggie Chung actually ended up um marrying the director of this film a couple years after it came out though. Really? Yeah. Oh. But, well, I mean, they divorced only like a few years after, but, yeah. That's... Yeah. 
I mean, such is the the thing when you. I don't like Irma Vet herself. Uh, a lot of characters in this film just sort of make assumptions about Maggie Chung and also just other people when they might not really know them. Yeah, like yeah, a, um, like the the lesbian stuff is the most obvious of that. But there's but there's also like a, the director and the interviewer and. And even like the 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 takeover director who hasn't even met her, you know, it's yeah, they just make their own assumptions about who she is and her talents as an actor, and yeah, you know. I would probably um, say that I think it's between this or Hana B. This is probably one of one of my favorite films that we've seen so far. So. Oh, I do want to mention one more thing. There's that scene where Maggie Chung is in the hotel and there's the Sonic Youth song playing and she gets into character as Irma Vep and she, like, steals this handbag from another person in the hotel. But what's interesting is that, you know, her getting into character and sort of, you know, morphing her identity with the identity of the character... Um, doesn't really help her with the film. She ends up being late to the uh, shoot the next day. So I think that might be an intentional uh, piece of commentary, like... On method acting? Yeah. And how much it fucking sucks? Yeah. Um, yeah, uh... We've, we've yeah, certainly... I really... Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah, we've certainly had, like... Like I'm, I'm glad people are sort of wising up to the whole like method acting isn't actually that good a method, you know, thing. Cause, cause we had all those years back, we had like Jim Carrey pretending he was possessed by the ghost of like the, the dude he was doing the the autobiography for, and, and Andy Kaufman. Yeah, Andy Kaufman, and you know everyone's had their go at Jared Leto, rightfully so, for his for his junker performance, but those are only just like the, the two most famous examples, you know? Oh, I'm about to joke. <laughs> My big hunker hunker. It's joker time. Yeah. It's moment. um. Yeah. Um, I don't really have much else to say about this right now uh I'm, I'm probably just forgetting some points that i wanted to make which will happen but yeah i feel like i said a good amount about this film i really liked it um is there anything you have to say about it i think uh i think like the beginning and the end are like the most interesting parts of the film I feel like the the middle, not necessarily the middle, just like the scene after the the kitchen, everything between the kitchen and the next day is, is sort of like the least interesting part of the film for me. And it sort of dragged a bit because I didn't feel like it had anything interesting to say about the characters or the film industry or people's opinions on art house or whatever i i just felt it was sort of like filler like you could like cut or trim or edit it and it and you wouldn't really lose much aside from maybe the the scene where she goes full jared leto mode but mm -hmm. that's really about it other um, than that i i i enjoyed pretty much everything about this film i've seen a few films where with uh maggie chung and she is a pretty great actor and she's in some pretty great movies but uh yeah um yeah i would say yeah uh i said before but maggie chung is probably the best part of the film so yeah <laughs> anyway um yeah i really like this film personally it's it's actually the second film i've seen from the director the first one i saw was called cold water which 
I did kind of like, or not kind of liked, I, I liked it pretty, pretty well. But this, I think, was a better film, and I would like to check out more from the director, personally. Um, but yeah, I would recommend this film, um, and I would give it an 8 out of 10, personally. I, I really liked it. I'd probably give it like a, like an eight or a nine, not a, not a 10, but like yeah. somewhere between like an 8.5 or something. Yeah. Uh, if you want to watch this film, we both watched it on the Criterion channel. So it's, I mean, I hear HBO, um, HBO Max is also going to be shutting down but i do believe that the film is also on there to stream if you have that as well yeah it's on hbo max they i think the director of this film also remade it a few years oh, yeah. later as a mini series so actually not a few years later it was relatively recent i think it was only like a couple years ago oh really let me let me look it up uh, yeah, I haven't seen it, so I can't comment on the quality of it. But I do think it's kind of interesting that this film is about a remake, or a crew remaking a film, and then he ended up remaking this film. It literally premiered 2002 at the Cannes Film Festival. Oh, um, hmm. Yeah, the, the miniseries, I mean. Um, no, on here it says the miniseries was from 2022. That's what I said, 2022. You said 2002, oh, whatever. <laughs> I misspoke. That's probably what happened. All right, yeah. So if you can see this film, uh, go ahead and do so. And, uh, I actually have not decided what film I would like to see next, but hopefully we'll decide Aww, that. That's unfortunate. Yeah. Because well, I'm a lazy, dumb, bastard, poopy face. So. Don't put yourself down like that, bro. You gotta stay on the grind set. It's a new year, and uh, you know, gotta make new goals and. Stick to them. My goal like, you have more power than you think. Everyone in the audience, you can do more than you think you can if you just believe you can and you stick to it. Yeah. My goal is to uh, win the lottery and become very fucking rich. So... Yeah, that's my New Year's well, resolution. Well, he's not a non-zero um, possibility to that, but that is an addictive and dangerous behavior, so maybe don't do that. Don't, like, spend all your savings on lotto tickets and bankrupt yourself in the pursuit of winning it big, winning big. Money, money, money. Anyways, we will, we will be back. Uh, will be ambiguous whether or not I have a house next time we come back, but uh, we'll see you next episode. Goodbye. Right. Hopefully next time I won't be a sputtering, coughing mess, but yeah. To everyone, Happy New Year, and see you next time. Bye.